could you yeah we've got everybody now okay that's great and just just remember to alex it's fine <laughs> it's fine as long as we can see some sort of approximation of your face that's good um and, and just remember to keep your mics off unless it's actually your speech okay and milo if you're on your phone you're going to have to try and keep it still okay Tr try and keep it still we can't hear you milo yeah milo you're muted i think muted yeah but uh, yeah, keep keep it muted um, while Mr. Hyams is speaking. Just have your microphone on when it's your turn to speak. All right, Sam, it's chaos. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure it will work in a minute. Right, Mr. Hyams, would you like to carry on, please? Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, the House will come to order. I am delighted to welcome you all to our first ever online debate. It's so great to see so many of you. Please make sure your microphones are muted before we start. And if you're one of the speakers, make sure your camera is on. I think we've done all of that. The motion before the house is, this house prefers virtual school. Representing the proposition are the first speaker, Adam Dodd, and the second speaker, Alex Lawrence. Speaking for the opposition are the first speaker, Sam Munro, and the second speaker, Milo Herdow. The summing up speeches will be done by Milo and Adam. After the main speeches, there will be a floor debate, followed by the summing up speeches, and finally a judge's verdict from Tom Watson in year 13, instead of an audience vote. Thank you, Tom. If you're in the audience, please be ready to ask lots of questions in the floor debate to make up for the loss of points of information. Main speeches will be timed and should be no longer than five minutes. No points of information may be made because of the nature of an online debate. You will hear one knock with my trusty hammer to indicate that you've one minute left and two knocks to indicate the end of your speech. I now call upon the first speaker for the proposition, Adam, to begin the debate. Hello, Chair, Opposition and Judge. Today, I will be arguing on the motion that this house prefers virtual school. I will be arguing on the points on how it offers a flexible learning schedule, how there are no disruptions and bullying you would have in a classroom environment, and that it improves learning technology. My partner will be arguing that virtual, virtual schooling discourages sleep, de sleep deprivation, how it is more eco-friendly and how it encourages individuality. For my first point, virtual schooling offers a flexible learning schedule and allow students to adapt it at will. School is, a very structure, school is very structured, with most schools following a strict schedule. This adaptable schedule is really helpful, as if teachers set the work early, and if students are confident, then they can do the work at their own pace. Also, this allows people who are falling behind to catch up. If the schoolwork is set for the following day, then they can do the work. If people are ill, they can look at the word work which most people record and can continue. This means students miss less lessons and have more learning time, whereas in school they might only get told the homework and not get set anything else. With these changes comes more free time. Some people with this free time may play computer games or ride unwind, but some students will take part in extracurricular activities or maybe go for a run. Some students might decide to extend their knowledge by looking up information online. If you finish early at school, you would just tell the teacher and he would set some monotonous work, but at home you can research and explore. This flexible learning schedule allows people to catch up and go learn for themselves. Some people get bored in school with the 2013 Gallup poll of 500,000 students found through elementary school, eight out of 10 and engaged, and in high school, four out of 10 and are engaged. When asked to describe school, 50% chose bored and 42% chose tired. For my second point, there is no disruption in class. In face-to-face -face classes, people like to show off by making jokes and actions. Although there is no punishment in virtual school, it is impossible to show off as microphones can be muted. And even if people mess around with the settings, these can be changed to stop that. Children show off to get a reaction from classmates, and if it is a live lesson, then nobody will react. This working without disruption allows them to concentrate on work instead of laughing at other people. 
This will increase productivity and reinforce the fact that virtual school is better than non-virtual school. This disruption also frustrates the teacher and may make them change their light, mind about doing fun things and the students will find the lesson boring. As well as disruption, there is bullying. Bullying is a big part of schools with a fifth to a quarter reporting being bullied. This was a part of a 118 page document released by the government. Although cyberbullying is possible, it is easy to block. You cannot block a person in real life. Although cyberbullying happens, it is easier to be prevented, unlike normal bullying, with teachers having to get involved and some kids afraid to say how they are feeling. Virtual schooling would drastically decrease these numbers. Although people would get bullied, it would be less likely to happen in a school environment. For my third point, the learning technology is greatly, greatly improving. Programmes such as Teams, Hegarty Maths and BBC Bite Size are keeping up with the demand with an increase in downloads and upgrades. They allow more content to be available and make school life better. They allow teachers to talk one to one on one with their students if they're struggling. It can also allow links to helpful websites that you can't get in a regular lesson. These are massively beneficial and can really help the child to learn at their own pace and expand their knowledge in their own way. Virtual school takes you teaches you the same things as non-virtual school, but by using te programs like Teams and BBC Bite Size, they can get an extra level of knowledge. These programs, although they have their difficulties, they have resources and knowledge the teachers might not have known about. These programs are help re helping replicate school, but with added bonuses. These upgrades are only going to get better, with Teams recently upgrading to have nine people on the screen and allowing pupils to raise their hands. They also allow teachers to set deadlines on work and send out emails if people forget. This overall allows more work to be done in a shorter space of time and makes less homework, which allows more free time and allows teenagers to get sleep, which my partner will go into more detail about later. My three points have been the learning technology is improving. It, is, it offers a flexible learning schedule and it reduces bullying and disruption. Here's a quote from Stella Ad Adler. You cannot afford to confine your studies in the classroom. All of history and the world is your classroom. Thank you for listening. I thank Adam for his remarks and we shall now hear for, from the first speaker for the opposition, which is Sam. Hello everyone. Welcome chair and floor. Today, me and Milo will be opposing the motion this house prefers virtual school. Milo will be talking about the mental health issues that many students go through, not enough, not enough motivation to do work and the absence of end of year exams. Whereas I'll be talking about not being able to access sports facilities at school, the absence of a timetable and thus not putting as much effort into work and the absence of class discussions. I'm sure most of you are trying to keep fit during the lockdown. However, despite efforts, I imagine you still find yourself not doing as much exercise as you would be as, as if you were at school. Games, PE, lunch and break, and even walking between the classrooms and walking up and down the corridors of LMS, are all types of exercise that we do at school. Also, weekend fixtures that would have once offered us a refreshing, a, a refreshing amount of exercise on the weekends aren't taking place and thus even further diminishing the amount of exercise that we can do. A study by the British Schooling Institute in 2008 found that uh, the students are up to two times more happy while exercising with their peers than while exercising by themselves. This could link in to the key and vital mental health issues that Milo is going to talk about later. During lockdown, I must have participated in what has felt like a thousand different classes. And I'm sure you have too. But if you can honestly say to yourself that you have given your most effort in every single one of those classes, then I think you're kidding yourself. Due to a lack of enforcement, I've often found myself deviating from the timetable. However, and while the opposition may say this is a good thing and that students can now complete work in their own time, I find that students are not putting in as much effort or as much time as they would otherwise do if there was a timetable. For example, I would like to present to you a stud, a, an experiment by the University of Plymouth on a high school in Bath. 
what they did was they took away the timetable for a week and scheduled tests at the end of the week. By the third day, the school had descended into total chaos, with only one in 10 students knowing what they were learning and when. And when the time came for the exams at the end of the week, students found themselves dropping at least two, on average, at least two grades in their exams. This is not something we should be putting at risk just so that we can meet, mitigate the effects of bullying. Next, uh, for the year nine's in this call, next year is the start of our GCSE course, and we need to be putting in as much effort now to save ourselves later and so that we can, uh, so that we can ultimately get good, GSE, good, yeah, not speak, get good GCSEs. In my experience, you can't beat a good face-to-face -face conversation. And the, BBC agree, and the BBC statistics agree with me. They found that one in ten people. They found that one in ten people learn worse when having no face-to-face -face conversations. And while this means that you can control the class more with things like muting mics and turning off cameras, it gets rid of vital class discussion, which blunts three years of developing social skills with our teachers. This is not something we should be willing to sacrifice. Just so that we can, this is not something we should be willing to sacrifice just so that we can have better enforcement in the classroom. This should be up to the teacher to do and not up to the software that we use. Uh, to summarise, I would like to say that virtual schooling has taken away three aspect, vital aspects of school. It has taken away the sports that we all do together and that links us together as a school and a community. It has taken away the timetable that provides an essential structure to our, to our school and it has taken away the social skills. Just because someone is in a, just because someone is an inner call doesn't mean that they are actively engaged in a call. To, to leave you, I would like to leave you on a quote from Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Quality means to do something right and to do it well when no one is looking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for Tom, just so you know, the first speech was five minutes and the last speech was four minutes and 40 seconds. Um, thank you. I now call upon the second speaker for the proposition to complete the proposition's case, Alex. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex, and I'm here today to argue how online schooling is preferable to regular schooling due to mental health benefits for students, how it encourages individuality and the environmental benefits of working from home. First, however, I would like to address some points made by Sam. You said that um, students find that exercising with peers um, is a lot more um, efficient, like you learn better and you have a more enjoyable time while exercising with friends. You can still do that. Like the lockdown situation we're in now isn't permanent. And by saying we would rather go to online schooling, you can still meet up with your friends. So you can still exercise with your peers. And you said about timetables, how there isn't any timetables and schools descended into madness, but there are still timetables we still have to attend the lessons in time. We have online calls that we have to go to. So it's not like we're just completely doing what we want, but it does give us more freedom that can be useful as I'll later talk about. So firstly is the issue of sleep deprivation that many students throughout the UK and the rest of the world have experienced and how working from home helps solve this. According to Stanford University, more than 87% of American high school students get far less than the recommended 10 hours of sleep each night. This is such a problem because sleep is vital for our well-being and helps, helps us to deal with the stress of everyday life. Not getting enough sleep can limit your ability to learn and concentrate, therefore making schooling less effective. Working from home, as we have been doing for the past few weeks, allows students to get that few extra hours of sleep that are so important. Now, the opposition may just say to go to bed earlier. However, that isn't always possible. For people like myself who live far away from school, 
By the time we get home and finish homework, it's already too late. This, of course, becomes more of an issue as we progress through the years and school work becomes harder and longer and we get more of it in preparation for our exams. Working into the night and then waking up at the crack of dawn to drive to school can have a huge toll on the mental health of individuals, especially teenage students who already have a lot to deal with. Online schooling is the perfect solution to this as students would observe much, help, much healthier sleeping patterns, therefore allowing us to learn more and in a shorter period of time. On to my second point of how working from home by oneself encourages individuality and allows students to work at their own pace, which is an extremely important skill for later in life and how this freedom makes work more productive. Allowing pupils to work more freely on their own schedule, more or less, without being handheld by teachers would allow students to learn how to work by themselves and manage their own time, which can be very useful for later in life. For example, when in university, you aren't told to do work at a certain time or in a certain way. Um, and this is left for you to decide. Students being able to master this early with the use of online schooling will have a head start for these occasions and will make individuality a more common trait among pupils. Allowing students this allowing students this freedom of working when and how they want also means that the work they do will more likely be of higher quality and the learning pupils undergo while choosing their own conditions will be more effective. According to Hive, the project managing company that works with companies such as Uber, 61 percent of employees are more productive when the dress code is relaxed and 80 percent of employees who work in an environment with a dress code don't find it useful. Relaxed dress code conditions are exactly what we have been observing while working from home, and this will inevitably cause an increase in work productivity throughout schools. On to my final point. Working from home provides a huge benefit to the environment. Without the need to travel to school itself, which most pupils do by car, many millions of tonnes of carbon emissions will not be released into our environment, or at least at a significantly reduced rate. In China, the country known to be the most polluting in the world, carbon emissions have fallen by nearly 18 percent due to staying at home. Um, we have been observing the staying at home we've been observing due to coronavirus and in Europe by only by almost 400 million metric tons, according to the National Geographic. This is becoming increasingly more important as the world becomes more and more polluted. Of course, it could be argued that this would be prevented by riding a bike to school or by driving an electric car. However, however these aren't always viable options due to people living too far away and the price um, of getting a new car. As well as helping the environment by reducing carbon emissions, working from home has other benefits. With students working from home rather than being in school, power consumption would be significantly less therefore allowing the school to avoid the vast majority of electricity charges. The same goes for waste that accumulates throughout the school day and supplies that get used, such as paper. It is significantly cheaper for schools to run work from home lessons and therefore would be cheaper for students like us going to a private school and to our parents also. To wrap up my points, I've argued how online schooling will help battle sleep deprivation among students. Stop talking, Alex. How working from home pu will helps pupils' individuality and the unmistakable positive impact on the environment working from home presents. Thank you. Um, th thank you. Uh, so for Tom, the that speech was um, six minutes. Thank you. I now call upon the second speaker for the opposition, Milo, to conclude the opposition's case. Floor, madam, I'm here to continue the opposition to the motion that this house prefers virtual school. There are three main points I will be talking about. The mental well-being of students, the fact that students are less motivated to work than ever before, and the absence of end of years or tests in any field. Firstly, though, some rebuttal against Alex. Whilst you say that many students could go and exercise with their friends in their free time, most students wouldn't do so unless they were forced. Lots of people are lazy and wouldn't actually bother to do any exercise if they weren't told to. But when you're at school, you're forced to, which is much better for the kids involved. As well as that, 
when people are in were well, not in uniform, it's been reported that the productivity is significantly lower, especially in places like schools. Now, first, the mental well-being of students. An obvious example is the fact that students do worse. Just talk to any of them. They're feeling worse and their levels of anxiety and depression are much higher. According to a study by the Changji Medical College in China at the beginning of this lockdown, a percent of students had severe anxiety, a massive increase from previous pre-lockdown numbers. 2.7% had moderate anxiety and 21.3% had mild anxiety. This was only at the beginning. Um, by then, those students had only been in lockdown for a couple of weeks. Imagine what those numbers would be now. As well as that, though, you can see that these have already risen massively from what they were previously were pre-lockdown, with almost a quarter of all students with some sort of anxiety, which can easily lead to depression or even suicide. This mental well-being and the mental health state leads well into my second point. Students feel less motivated to do work, and when they do do work, it's often to a much lower standard. It feels like there are no points, and the results have shown the students are doing considerably worse in grades and in their performance. Only 6% of secondary school lessons in the UK were online. No students can't learn if they're just given a PowerPoint or nothing at all. These are horrifying numbers and truly show the fact that in general, these students are not given an adequate education. There isn't teachers and there isn't a true enforcement of work. And because of that, the work they do get done, if any, is much worse and to a lower extent. They don't have anyone they can easily talk to to understand and get feedback from. And often so when they do, it's still not very detailed, maybe a couple sentences. This makes students feel less and less care, gives them less and less care about the work they produce and makes them feel less and less motivated to do it in the first place. At the end of this, these students end up doing almost no work and horrible work for the actual work they do do. And finally, the absence of end of years or any tests in general. There is no way to definitively monitor how well these students are doing and what progress they have made because of this. It's much harder to then grade them and give them the right set for the next year and to understand the progress and track what's happened with them. As well as that, A-levels and GCSEs are currently cancelled, but even if they do go, even if they do go ahead, they'll be postponed later than usual, and the students will have had much less time to actually properly revise. They won't have been able to do mocks or talk with the uh, other teachers and understand how they were doing, or get true feedback on what they wanted. There won't be one-on-one -on -one meetings, and you can't have a meeting, for example, with a teacher after school properly gauge how well they're doing. When these exams do happen, either if it's next year, there'll be an overwhelm to the university system with two years applicants applying at once. This could mean that there's a reduced in space and that it could mean an overwhelm in some courses. As well as that, GCSEs are being cancelled. Everyone is working towards them, but if they aren't ever happening, then you can feel like, what's the point? As well as that, um, the fact that they aren't going ahead means that there's much less for universities to base them on. And if they do have a look at them, then there will be much less work they will have been able to do in school, with almost a quarter of their year being at home. And these will greatly screw any results which do happen. But to finish, I'd just like to ask anyone a question. Would you like to do one of the most important areas of your life for only half a year's actual education before it? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was four minutes 50. Thank you. I would now like to invite members of the house to speak from the floor. With those wishing to ask a question or comment, and hopefully you've all got lots of questions and comments, please raise a virtual hand on Teams Give their name and address their remarks through me as Mr. Chairman when I call upon you. Please make sure you have your microphone turned on as you put your hand up and your camera too, if possible. Mrs. Leach. 
on. I took my microphone on. Um, right. Uh, well, a couple of questions, really, um, to everybody. Um, nobody's really mentioned the issue of screen time. Um, that most of you, because of um, virtual lessons, are actually spending about seven, seven and a half hours a day on a screen. Um, does that matter? Is that important? Um, and secondly, um, you know, given that most schools actually aren't providing live lessons, um, a lot of schools aren't providing live lessons like Stanford, um, are you really saying that the benefits of virtual school are really only for those students who are already independent and self-motivated um, and not for anybody else. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I can see no other hands up at the moment, but you, mu you must have questions. Ah, oh, there we are. Uh, oh, off you go, Tom. Uh, 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 something that I thought perhaps could be addressed from both sides is the effect of the lockdown and online teaching on younger children. So sort of reception up to year six. So yeah, you've spoken about uh, year year seven through nine, and obviously looking at A levels and GCSEs. But what do you think the effect will be on those younger children that are quite at a developmental stage in their lives? Come on, boys. I'm, I'm, all of you know a lot about this topic now. I'm sure somebody's got a question. Come on, it's no fun if you don't ask any questions. Somebody ask a question. Otherwise, I'm going to pick someone to ask a question. <laughs> no? I, how about um, James Lord? James Lord, have you got a question, please? Uh, <laughs> Miss, I have a question. Off you go then, Edward. Um, if you had to choose between live lessons and being set assignment, which one would you choose? Thank you. One more question. Anybody? Ah, oh, Mr Sharp, off you go. What do you think the benefits of live lessons are and the benefits of just being set work instead of actually being talked to? And then a uh, final question, thank you, from Finn Hewitt. Uh, hi, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to ask as well, what do you think about not being able to properly socialise or not as much socialising with friends as like in big groups if you're going to play like a game of rugby or something together what would you think like the uh, consequences of not being able to do that and how that affects like mental health and sort of those sort of things thank you thank you very much uh so moving on from questions then i now call upon the second speaker of the opposition milo to briefly sum up the issues raised in the debate and to answer questions that arose from the floor debate so I think that there are two main points of clash here. Firstly, over how good was the actual learning and what was what are the payoffs when you look at this? When you're in online and when you're at home, if you're online, how good is the actual lesson? And we have conflicting arguments. Some of us are saying that you're able to have flexible screen time, whilst we are saying that you should that it's much worse and there's less motivation. Then when it comes to the floor, um, some said that um, the screen time would be much worse. This is completely correct. This is just another reason why we should be at school. There's less screen time, which is better for our eyes. And it helps you, for example, if you need to sleep. If you want to have better bedtimes, you need to ha um, not be on screens for an hour before then. Otherwise, you won't properly sleep and you'll negate all effects of actually having an earlier bedtime with no real reason. Then, the education for younger children is much worse. People in reception in year one need a much more physical education, they need to be able to touch and draw and paint. And many families just don't have the resources to be able to properly stimulate their learning environment correctly. They'll end up with a much worse education and stunted social development from not being able to communicate with other people at such an important time in their lives. As well as this, um, 
as only 3% of all primary schools are actually having live lessons, they won't even be seeing anyone, even online, most of the time. Then, um, it comes to the fact that, uh, what would you really choose? Would you rather be in a lesson where you're able to talk to the teacher and be able to ask questions on long term without needing to worry about your internet cutting out halfway through? Or would you rather, or would you sit in your bedroom uh, depressed and with really bad work whilst you can't connect to any lessons because you're in a different time zone as your border? Thank you. Thank you very much, Milo. I now look, call upon the first speaker of the proposition, Adam, to give his summing up speech and conclude the debate. Thank you. So for the start, I'll be answering some questions from the floor. About the issue of screen time. Um, so Milo made the point of one hour before bedtime, but that is invalid as there is little to no homework as we are not supposed to be set it. And as we finish the day at school, uh, as we finish the um, day at school at four, uh, unless you go to bed at five, that's not very useful. And also at school, you get set more homework and that homework sometimes can stretch late into the night. And if it's on the computer, then you're going to be on that an hour um, before bedtime anyway. Also um, on the issue of like reception, year one and development, de developmental ages. Uh, my sister is in reception right now and she has learned She's getting a good, um, say, getting set a good amount of work and is learning actually quicker than she would be, be at school, but because they set stuff that's not actually access, which is accessible to everybody. Uh, I think there are two main um, areas of clash. One of which is the timetable, which um, I think we won this as timetable is not a big part of school. And then the example you gave was invalid, as in this, uh, as now there is still a timetable. It is just a little bit more flexible, unlike the one where you gave or one uh, where students drop two grades lower. That was when there was absolutely no t timetable at all. This flexible timetable allows more f freedom, but people still attend live lessons and still do the work, but more efficiently on better programmes. Another key area of clash that I thought was that people do less exercise. Again, I think we won this clash as the fact that games and PE still give more incentive to people to do exercise as we are usually set tasks which are frequently carried out. Also, this allows us to meet up with friends more. In school, you wouldn't really meet up with friends that you have around your neighbourhood and you might fall out with some of your old primary school friends. This would allow you to meet back up with them. Also, lockdown has left people bored and many people have turned to exercise as a form of entertainment. I know that I have had more of an incentive to go on my bike or go for a run due to lockdown. This is also because you have lots of free time. Although video games are good, they get boring. I would just like to highlight me, me and my partner's points. Sleep, uh, virtual school encourages sleep deprivation. It encourages individual, it discourages sleep deprivation. It encourages individuality. It is more eco-friendly. It is improving the learning technology. There is no disruptions in bullying and it offers a flexible learning schedule. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, so now I'll hand over to Tom, our esteemed judge, for his verdict and feedback. You might need a minute. Right. Um, yeah, just give me a second just to review. Um, but just first of all, I want to say well done uh, to everyone because it's, I'd say, quite difficult to do this all online. Um, so, you know, really well done. Um, what do, I'll quickly just look at what each side I think did well and what could be improved upon and then I'll give a verdict at the end. So looking at the proposition, um, I'd say to, to begin with uh, for the first speaker, probably a good idea to define exactly what we were talking about today. Um, I think you all sort of got the, the general idea that there's not really much um, to argue or um, disagree over the, sort of the definition, but perhaps looking at it um, and what bringing the scope of the debate just a bit more well defined, it's just a lot easier to follow. Um, I liked the signposting from both sides, it definitely made it a lot easier to follow. And I, I think most speakers, if not everyone, you, um, you structured your points very well. I knew exactly what point you're at and when you moved on. Um, for everyone, actually, 
uh, what I'd look at is once you've finished your your main point, you've got you say say three main points. Once you finish that first, second, or third point, just have a nice ending just to completely show that you finished that point and you've rounded it off. Because sometimes they sort of bled into each other and it wasn't always clear. But then um, you know you, you did make it clear later on. But if you just do that, it makes it completely abundantly clear. Um, yeah, of course, look out for timings but you know it's not really end of the world um i liked some of uh, the points made by the proposition um i think there was sort of a good uh, mixture of things looked at i think the sleep deprivation one was a, was a clever one i didn't think of it and i can definitely tell you that i've slept a lot better um not having to do any lessons uh, but that's just me um in terms of uh, improvement yeah just look at um rounding off those ideas a bit better um, and um, just obviously uh, stay within the time limit. Uh, moving on to the opposition, uh, obviously we do need rebuttal straight away, That that's, that's clearly needed otherwise um, we don't, you, you've sort of just capitulated to the first speaker and said ah oh, they've won at that point. Uh, so even if it is just a little thing just give some rebuttal. Um, I liked that the sport um, uh, topic and the uh, the ending of the first speaker. I'd just say um, the timetable and discussion points they sort of bled into each other, but where there were key ideas, they were you know definitely um, very valid and um, added to the debate. For the second speaker, um, very good points. Definitely the the mental health idea and obviously the exams. That's something that I can attest to. It's very weird having your exams just cut off completely. And being left in the in the lurch in that regard, and that's definitely good that you you brought that in. Um, what I would say is, and that came up in the questions, that there were some areas that no one touched upon, and that's probably just due to the time. So obviously, I spoke about younger children. I think Miss Leach um, brought a very good point with regards to other schools. This debate was very much Stanford centric, uh, but there are countless schools across the country who aren't doing things like this, who will just get sent a packet of work, and and that's it. So. You know, having looked at that, probably if you had a few extra minutes, you would have um, would have made all the difference. In terms of the summary speeches, um, the the overall structure from both sides was right. You had your questions, you had your clash, and you had uh, you summarised um, what you've spoken about. Um, I'd said I would say that one side, in terms of their clash, I think was a bit clearer and was very evident to why they won. Um, but for both sides, actually, with your endings for the summary speeches, you know, this is the last time anyone's going to hear you speak. Make it extraordinarily emphatic and, and you know, hit really hit that point home. But um, it was all, all very, very good and probably quite hard to choose a winner. And I can't do my usual um, bits where I can look at how you sort of address address the floor and how, how eye contact and that sort of thing. Uh, so it is going to be more on a content um a content um, idea and what I thought is that some of the points made by one of the, the teams um, was a little bit more nuanced and looked at some areas that I wouldn't have immediately thought of and I thought the summary was just slightly better that just pushed them over the line so I would give it to the proposition for that reason. Well done. Thank you very much, Tom. It's much appreciated. And on behalf of the House, I would like to thank the speakers for their impressive performances this afternoon. Thank you for coming. And also, if anybody's got any ideas for further online debate this half term um, or would like to get involved in a debate, then please speak to Mrs. Leach. And thank you very much. OK, and yes, thank you very much to everybody who came um, and boys, you'd better get off to your live lessons now, back to your virtual learning. OK, um, maybe Mr. Hyams and Tom could just stay on the call for a bit longer. Um, but the rest of you, thank you very much to the speakers, particularly um, and uh, off, off to your live lessons. OK, bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Miss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.